Hello, welcome to episode 181 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand One Movies You Must See Before You Die, 1991's The Double Life of Veronique, directed by Krzysztof Kieślowski. This isn't my first foray into the world of uh, Kieślowski's work. I watched the, Col the Three Colors trilogy at least five years ago now. I uh, really sorely need to revisit those films, and I think two-thirds of them are in the book. So uh, this is the first, but not the last, Kieślowski review in the Epic Film Challenge 2. But The Double Life of Veronique has intrigued me ever since I saw the Three Colors trilogy. He made it just before he did the Three Colors trilogy. It stars the lead actress from Red, which is Irene Jacob, in one of her first film roles. She was very much, uh, not unknown, but she wasn't a name actress at the time that she made the, the Double Life of Veronique. And I had no idea really what to expect, because I knew that the story was around a woman who has, well, two women who look exactly the same, and I didn't know anything else apart from that. I didn't know whether these two women met, I didn't know, you know what the context of the story was, where it was going in any way, shape or form. And I started watching this film a few years ago and I, I got like 15 minutes into it and I felt like waiting until I picked up the Criterion Blu-ray before continuing, so that's what I did. Finally picked it up and uh, checked it out a few days ago. And before I even get to the film, what really enamored me with Kislowski as a filmmaker was the booklet for the Criterion, which has a lengthy um, piece that he wrote or was transcribed from him giving an interview talking about his process and talking about the making of this film. And I just loved his mindset on making films, how open he is to collaboration, how open he is to ideas uh, coming and entering into his movies and his take on making movies. And how the audience should feel, how he feels the audience should feel, how much he values editing, how he feels that the editing is really where the movie is made. And a really interesting fact is that he made around 15 to 20 different versions of this film, where all told, there was about 15 to 20 cuts of the double life of Veronique, uh, with different kind of ways and, and kind of paths gone to that weren't in the, I, I guess what you call it, the theatrical cut. Uh, there's only really two cuts, the, the theatrical and the American cut. The American cut has a few more shots at the end. It's an alternate ending, but it isn't really, it doesn't really add that much. It's on the criteria and I watched it and it doesn't really seem to enhance the experience all that much to me. He talks in the book, uh, in the, the piece about how at one point he thought it would be great to have uh, as many cuts of the film as there were cinemas screening it. So that literally a, a unique cut of the film would be sent to every single cinema. So you would be watching, like, he, he said something like, you know, 0234B <laughs> version of the film, you know, and that 0234A would be ever so slightly different to the point where you wouldn't even really notice it, just a little bit of a longer shot here or there, and that every version of the film would be handmade, you know. But, you know, the, he, he said that they were too far into production, there was no time and certainly no money to, to do that kind of thing. But I love the concept of it. And overall, he said of the, the double life of Veronique, he was about a third happy with it. And he, and he thinks that that's kind of all you can really hope for as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, is to be at least a third happy with, uh, with what you get and with what you envisioned in your mind being put onto the screen. Anyway, I just found that interview to be fascinating, and there's so much more to it as well, about how, again, open he is to collaborating and taking ideas from anyone who has ideas of value that will shape the film and move it in a different direction that could be more interesting and beneficial to the story he's trying to tell. The story follows a, a young woman called Veronica, uh, a Polish woman, played by Irene Jacob. Now, at first, I wasn't sure what to expect, so to be honest with you, the first 40 minutes of this film, I was thinking we were seeing two characters. Uh, I really was. I thought that it was it was being imperceptible almost uh, as as to which was which, and I was trying to figure out. Okay, is this Veronica or Veronique? Is this Veronica? Or... I wasn't sure. Turns out halfway through the film, Veronica's story ends, and that's when we get to Veronique, a young woman, a French woman living in in France, and then we get her story. So it's very much a two part story. Veronique's story is a little bit longer. Veronica's a little bit shorter, um, but there's quite a bit of substance to both. I'd say a lot more probably to Veronique's story. So it, it's very clear cut. It, it isn't a kind of moving back and forth between these two characters. They share one scene together, and I won't spoil what that is, but it's a very memorable scene. But apart from that, we basically get Veronica's story, 
Veronique story. Although we open with, and I really like this kind of visual idea, we opened with an upside down shot of the night sky. We see a skyline and then the, the stars, and it's basically the young, I think Veronica or Veronique, being held by her mother with her head upside down. Uh, and then we get another shot of the other character as a young girl being shown a leaf by, by their mother. So we get kind of a little introduction to these two characters and also the um, the idea of the world being upside down is kind of thrown in there a few times. There's a scene where Veronica's on a train and she has a little clear see-through ball and she's looking through the train window, through the ball, and the, the houses that are going past her and outside the train are upside down. And so it's that idea of almost parallel worlds, in, in a sense, but I don't think that the the plot of having these two women who look exactly the same, these doppelgangers, I don't think it's meant to have this kind of cosmic relevance or anything, or that it's even science fiction. Maybe it's something deeper. Maybe it's more of a spiritual connection. And it's very much about a connection that might be there between these two women who are, you know, uh, complete. well, no, they're not completely different, but they're in completely different countries, you know, and they, they live different lives, but yet they kind of have the same things going on. They're both singers. Veronique is a music teacher and Veronica is a, a choir girl and, and sings and so on. But to me, this film is very scant in terms of plot. Um, there's plot that moves Veronica and Veronique through you know the story and through the scenes that we see, but it's very much about feelings. And you know, I'm definitely one of those people who likes to have a clear cut plot, but if you're gonna give me a film that doesn't really go anywhere, as far as a traditional plot sense, you know, you don't have like a conflict and then a resolution, that kind of a thing. Um, and I guess you kind of do have that with this a little bit. And all I'm saying is it's a different kind of film that is more about the moments than it is the overall story, I feel like. It's more about the the emotions and the just the cinematic wonder that you get out of, out of a film if it gives you that. And this film gave that to me. It was It's stunning to look at, uh, absolutely stunning. They use this kind of golden filter over a lot of the scenes, which gives it this otherworldly quality. It makes everything look, as Koslowski says in that book that I was talking about, he says that the filter they use makes everything look much more beautiful than it really was. And that he, he admits that that filter will probably turn some people off, but it's a very specific choice they made to heighten that sense of beauty. And uh, Irene Jacob was, you know, and probably still is a stunning woman. And so, especially at an early age, I think she's in her early 20s here, she's just, you know, very nice to look at. Just these beautiful shots, you know, and following this character, not in isolation, but in those quieter moments that people have when they're on their own, when she's just walking around her flat or whatever, and the, the joys that, that her characters go through and the sadnesses that her characters go through. I don't feel like there's too much of a, there's not really a quantum leap between Veronica and Veronique, and I suppose that's by design. Um, so to me it feels like one character she's playing, but I, I really loved her performance, it was very naturalistic. It was something that intrigued me, I wanted to know what was going on in her head, because not much was being revealed. Uh, a little bit was, but not too much. And I think that the key story was in Veronique's chapter, where she's a music teacher, and one day a puppeteer shows up at the school that she works at and gives a performance for the children. And it's a really cool story again where the filmmakers were trying to come up with uh, a profession for this man that Veronique was going to meet. And they remembered this thing they'd seen on TV of a puppeteer who used his hands. He didn't use strings. You could see his hands moving the puppets, but there was this weird quality to it that they quite liked. So they, they went to the Polish TV and we were trying to find out what that program was they saw years ago. It was some Jim Henson special and they find out who the, who the guy's name was. I think it was Bruce Schwartz, I want to say. This American puppeteer who was no longer in work because there, there just wasn't a, a market for it. And Koslowski says, please come work on my movie. We want to, to kind of showcase what you do, but also use it in our film for the story. So this guy came over. Uh, very much disenchanted with his profession and how it had kind of gone out of vogue, I suppose, and how he wasn't getting any work. And he got to perform for these these kids for real uh, in the film. They, they shot it a few different times. The, I love that the first time they shot the scene, they only filmed the kids. They didn't film the, the puppet show. Koslowski wanted the reactions of the kids. Another thing I really respect Koslowski for is that he said that there were so many wonderful shots they got of the kids reacting in awe and, uh, and being touched by this, this puppet show. But um, a lot of it was junked, and he said that he takes kind of a, almost a perverse pleasure in, uh, in junking really great footage because uh, he said that you really need to kind of figure out what's best for the film and not kind of top load your movie with great shots. You, know, you have to be willing to kind of let go of a great shot 
a beautiful shot if if it's only going in there because it's a beautiful shot that can't be the only reason you know and so that's something that I would struggle with to be honest with you so I, I have a lot of respect for the way he worked and that is and so we're introduced to this puppeteer character who does this very weird and, and interesting puppet show and she becomes intrigued by him and then he starts to follow her in a way this puppeteer very intriguing kind of mysterious storyline and I like where it went. It, it went in, in a direction I wasn't expecting. And by the end of the film, I felt like it was a, a natural way for that relationship to progress, I think. Uh, and I kind of, I bought into it, I believed it. And I didn't think that it was, uh, you know, this, this love story. It, it was something else. It was something more, something deeper. But at the same time, I feel like that this film is, is one of those things that you just get something, everyone's going to get something different out of it. And in a lot of cases, that'll be a negative thing, and they'll they'll be bored by it because the plot is very scant. But I mean, if you like beautiful images, you know, you'll probably enjoy <laughs> at least some of this film. I love the way it was shot. I love the cinematography. I I was enchanted by Irene Jacobs' performance. I think if you're not, then the film's going to fall flat on its face. And by the ending, I mean it really isn't. Uh, you know, oh, you know, it's kind of a, this ambiguous kind of, um, you know, just just a it just ends you know it isn't a, a resolution it's it's maybe a continuation that there, there, there's nothing really too um solid about the ending of this film and i kind of like that a lot of times i really don't like it in this case i kind of uh, i'll allow it you know it's a film i'm now going to go back to again and again and maybe get more out of it uh, dig deeper into the the themes that are being presented but it's just it's really about minutiae in a lot of senses these little moments, there's a scene, I mean it's just an odd one, but when uh, Veronica, I think, uh, I think it was the, the character from the, the first half of the film, she, she's walking outside and she's a bit kind of rattled by something, and it just looks stunning, the way they put the filter over it, and it just, this, this again, there's this feeling to, a richness to the image that just uh, draws me in so much. Uh, the way they shot this really is a big part of how good the film is, I think, and she sits down um, on this park bench and you know, her head is tilted and the camera's kind of slightly tilted. And there is a guy who walks up and just opens his uh, his his trench coat and you just see what's supposed to be his penis. I mean, you can kind of tell it's a, a dildo or whatever. And then he just closes it and walks past. Very odd scene. I don't know that why that happened. Other than that sometimes there are weirdos out there who do that kind of thing. But just the feeling of that scene, just this, this character having a quiet moment to themselves, which is something that rang really true to me for some reason. So there's lots of those little moments in the film. And you probably could dissect this and analyze it and kind of figure out exactly what every little thing means and how it correlates between the two women and what it really means. You know, wh why are there these two doppelgangers? Are they kind of cosmically linked? Uh, is there no link whatsoever? Is it, you know, uh, two, two women who are completely different? But, you know, they, they, they I don't know. They, there's lots of ways you can take your mind uh, into the film, which I find kind of cool and exciting. But... For me, I, I don't really feel like digging too deep into it. I kind of like just letting it wash over me, enjoying the beautiful images and the, the performances, and and that's pretty much it, I suppose. And so, yeah, I, I, was a, I was a big fan of this film. I think it's fantastic. I don't think it's quite that kind of masterpiece level that a lot of people put it at, but I can totally see why people would. I feel like on a different day of the week, or I feel like in a different point in my life, I could have watched this and gone... That's one of the best things I've ever, I've ever seen, you know, but right now it was just, it was great. It was really great. I, I really, really loved it. Um, but it didn't have that extra element of, oof, you know, uh, certainly uh, it moved me in a way towards the end in that kind of penultimate scene with the puppeteer and Veronique. That scene to me was so charged without really feeling like it was trying too hard to be charged. And I think that is, is either quite difficult or it's just a, a really kind of happy accident. Uh, Something about it just just really um, dug in deep with me. So there we go. I, I'm sure there's more I could go into, but again, as I said, it's a film I like to just kind of uh, experience and kind of uh, just watch and just let let myself feel whatever I feel. And uh, you know, bottom line, it's it's a stunning film to look at, and that goes a long way sometimes. If there's substance, and I feel like there's substance there, even though the plot doesn't really have any. So I've rambled on far far too long. But let me know your thoughts on the film. I, I feel this is a really interesting film. Uh, as soon as I saw it, I don't do this much, but on my personal Facebook, I was like, who's seen this film? No one really responded. Uh, I think one person did, but I'd like to get some discussion going on this. What do you think of the film? Do you think it's trite? Do you think it's rote? Do you think it's bollocks? Or do you think that it's a brilliant masterpiece that is one of the greatest films ever created? There's just so many... I could see so many opinions to this. It's one of those interesting films that... Uh, 
I, I don't think many people would have the same opinion on, at least fully. But is it a film you should see before you die? Absolutely. Because uh, you might find something really special in it. Uh, I don't think I found something really special in it, but I found something quite special in it. And on repeat viewings, it might change. It, the, the effect might lessen, it might get better, I don't know. But it's, uh, it's one that I'm certainly a big fan of right out of the gate with my first viewing. So thanks for watching. Uh, I'll see you in the next one.